Do you think it was the furry? Joining the Escape With Me book club, Escape With Me, Sam Reiner, and me, Caitlin, into our most recent read. Come with us as we evade reality and go into detail about a new book. We'll be covering the book from beginning to end, so there will be spoilers. Today we're going to London and Greece. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Published January 16th, 2024. The Fury is the third book by author Alex Michaelides. Hopefully that's right. Heralded as the modern day Agatha Christie with his first book, The Silent Patient, does this book write the sophomore slump he had or does it continue to drag down his reputation? Fun fact, the Goodreads scores for his books, I find fascinating. Yeah, I saw your comment, so I just pulled it up. Yeah, a 3.42 right now on Goodreads. Yeah, there is a noticeable downward tick on his books. Because his first one, Silent Patient, 4.18, which is very good because he has like over 2 million ratings. Yeah. And then the next book is 3.63, which is generous. And then this one's already 3.42. Yeah, not doing so well. Not great. This book is not great. (laughs) Part of me wanted to think that it's just not my style because there were a few interesting moments, sure, but no. Yeah. So background... I read the first book and I loved it. Yeah. And I recorded that episode with Danielle. And then we read the second book and hated it. Was not good. (laughs) Was not good. And then we read this one. It's still not good. And granted, the last book made me angry. Did not like it with a passion. And this one's just boring, I would venture to say. We can get into that in a second as I go over age level, which is adult. Oh, yeah. And our content warning. Intense ones here. It's not very long, but it's a a little bit intense. So we have the obvious ones with murder and blood. And then we have emotional abuse, both physical and emotional are mentioned. Then we have language, hard drug usage, and soft drug usage, suicidal ideations, child prostitution, and pedophilia. Yep. She's gonna throw that in there. That's a fun little list there. Judge a book by its cover. With the circles, I thought something that maybe an island. Oh, I thought it was an eye. Yeah, you have that black circle and then the light blue and then there's that bigger ring of blue. And so I thought this is going to be on an island. And so immediately I go to and then there was none, which one day I'll get you to read. But it takes place on an island and essentially people are getting killed off one after the other. It's a great book, has a great twist. All of it's very fun. So that's what I thought this was because his first book was Murder of Roger Ackroyd. The narrator did it. His second book was trying for something. I don't know. It felt a little bit more original. So I wondered if this one, he would go back to more of the formula that he had before. And so I was like, okay, yeah. And then there was none as a fun one. Everyone copies that one. And so I thought that's what this would be. And it wasn't. And I was disappointed. Nope. And again, what threw me off, as we will talk, is the constant referring to all the classic murder mystery novels and what I found I wanted to just shout at them the whole time like why aren't you bringing up Clue you're doing Clue a little bit that's what you're doing and never once was it mentioned ever and I was kind of frustrated by it he references Agatha Christie a lot there's a whole chapter where he makes up a Hercule Poirot character yep but he's Greek and so he has little physical differences but basically does what Hercule Poirot does and he does constantly reference Agatha Christie constantly the author is very aware of the publicity he got with his first book yes which I find super ironic I find it unfortunate for this book anyway because after reading this book the one question I really had was is he already out of ideas Are we on the third book and we're already scrambling for ideas? Because it goes back to the narrator did it. But it wasn't as good as the first book where you had the journal entries. The two different timelines. Nothing happened that changed my perspective of the entire book like the first one does. Yeah. With the journal. It's good and it has this whole shift and it makes you rethink everything and the main character. You view everything in a different light. And then you have this one where it's like, I'm just getting to the end to see who finally shoots Lana. Yeah. Basically. And then it's like, oh, it's Elliot. I'm like, not surprised at all. No. You're a little bit of a 
egomaniac with obsessive tendencies. Yeah. I'm not surprised you murdered her. And that was supposed to be the twist in it. And it's like, haha, I've been writing this down because I am the murderer. Okay. Yeah, not done nearly as well as the first time. It felt like a waste. Yeah. You get to the end and he finally shoots Lana and you're just like, oh. Well, we did see that coming. I liked that character. Yeah. Cool. I think the only true twist was Mariana actively visits... Whoa, what is that one dude's name? Theo. She visits Theo in jail. Yeah. She is a terrible judge of character. Because this book happens after the first book, but before the second book. Yeah, so apparently we're starting a Alex Michadeli's universe now. No, I knew it when he did it last book. We're starting a murder mystery universe. Last book, he pulled in Theo for no reason whatsoever. But yeah, you're just like, wow, Mariana, you're a terrible judge of character. Knowing what Theo did, you actively visit him in prison. And then despite the next book, when you're like, oh, I can't get emotionally involved with any of my clients. Yeah, this, I have opinions as a therapist that this woman now has had three of her therapy clients just get wrecked. Oof. I'm not surprised that you're a terrible judge of character and you didn't notice that they were sleeping together and then that your niece was trying to murder you. You're very bad at this. A little concerning. At least when Theo showed up in the second book, you were reminded why you like Theo as a character. Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, he's really good at what he does, which is admirable. And he's just really good at thinking things through and, and whatever. And you, I felt like that breathed fresh air into the situation where you're like, oh yeah, I did like you. Yeah. But this book, Mariana coming up, and I'm just like, thanks for the reminder of why I didn't like your book. That's fair. So, how do we even deal with the plot of this? How do we even go through this? Because it basically tells the exact same story like three or four different times. Yeah. Before we get into this, because it's not nearly as interesting, what are your thoughts on Elliot? Bad. Did not like him from the beginning. I didn't like him as a character or a narrator. Oh, he's heavily unreliable. Extremely unreliable from the first chapter. Yeah, and this is what I was saying. I don't know if it's just this isn't my type of story or what, but the constant breaking of the fourth wall. And I discovered something about myself. I have done a lot of work to build myself and surround myself by people who love themselves and their humor isn't based around self-degradation and all this kind of stuff. And so when I'm around people like that, or I hear people like that, it gets me so frustrated because I know how psychologically unhealthy it is. And that's just this man all over the place. And I get it comes from a place what they're trying to describe, like they do try to humanize him. But his constant breaking of the fourth wall is like, oh, sorry, I was too biased by including this one little tidbit of information. I'm like, my man, I didn't, was not a fan, did not enjoy him. It felt very grandiose. Yes, literally performative. It's literally performative. To me, he just had these visions that he was more important than he is. Absolutely. He would just throw stuff in there. I would have been fine if we had the first bit and it was like, hey, I'm going to tell you this story. Like we're sitting down in the bar and whatever. And then every so often, because the chapters are like three pages. Yeah, very short. Maybe five. And so I wouldn't feel so bad if every once in a while he threw in, okay, in that last chapter. After I was probably a little bit ungenerous to whoever, like Jason. But it's constant throughout the narrative. Yeah. And it's not, oh, dang it, I did it again. Let me fix it. It's literally paragraphs of him going on and being like, oops, I did the thing again. Well, I guess I am more important in my mind than whatever and blah, 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 blah. In fact, my therapist said. Yeah, it's nonsense. I did not enjoy the way it's written. And I loved at one point, like I literally made a comment in the notes. Like at one point he stepped back. He's like, I wish I knew what you thought of me. And I'm like, I'll tell you right now, man, I don't like you as a character or a narrator. You're just not great all around. Yeah. Something is not right with Elliot. No. And I don't know how much of his childhood and how much is his personal thing you're born with. And he goes into that, but instead of it being nature versus nurture, he says it's destiny versus choice. Mm. It's like you do things because of your personality, but your personality is based off destiny, basically, which I'm like, yeah. You know, you're an adult and you can choose to change your personality and and do stuff and whatever. So I... I, Someone like him, though, his personality does not or cannot change. No. 
he's pretty set. Yeah. And you're the professional here, but I didn't know if it was narcissism or sociopath or just obsessive personality or whatever it was. But it was just, you can tell immediately something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely not quite narcissistic because it's not the center on himself. Jason shows more narcissism than he does, but the obsession, I don't know, it's maybe more, not quite like antisocial, but it's that idea of I'm going to mask everything about my my true nature so that I can fit in with society kind of thing. But that and honestly, I liked the end when I got to the end and I was listening to the final few chapters with all of the stuff of the kid and everything. You can definitely tell Alex, the author, has that psych thriller part to him, too. Like he wants you to understand why this person is doing this. Right. And that's obviously why we like the silent patient was the psych part to it. I was actually questioning whether or not I liked the book as a whole by the end. But yeah, no, just that I have to mask so that everybody doesn't see who I really am. But but then I've convinced myself that I'm doing okay. But then when you see it from another person's perspective, you realize that they're not doing as well as they thought they were. Yeah, and just a little bit the nice guy of it, where he's like, oh, Lana's perfect. She's an angel. She's so kind and nice. And then she does something off script to him. And then he's like, murder. We missed a couple steps, my dude. Yeah, for sure. And just some of the other tendencies that he doesn't necessarily bring to the forefront, but you have to just sit there and think. He realizes that Kate and Jason are having an affair. And he goes out and he follows them and catches them in public, which they're idiots, but that's beside the point. But then he just keeps following them yeah, day after day after day and just writes down a list of times. And he's like, I'm not going to show her this. He's just stalking them now. Yeah, because in his mind, he's got to build up a case and prove what's going on so that he can tell Lana beyond a shadow of a doubt. But at the same time, he admits that he can't be the one to tell her. So why is he doing this yeah i don't know three would have been excessive but he just has an entire list in his notebook and there's something with the whole i consider myself an artist and he clearly thinks he's a writer of some point and he's like i sit down and i practice my craft over and over and over again and i guess one of the twists is finding out that he didn't write the play that got him a tony nomination yeah it was a barbara west play and that he just put his name on but he absolutely considers himself an artist. Yeah, like we said, that fraud identity mentality. Like, there's a section where he said he found who he wanted to be in a book, and I think the phrase that he used was like, you know, and Elliot Chase was born that night, like, in talking about it with Barbara, right? He did a complete identity shift, like, completely covering up of everything that he truly is into Elliot. So, none of it's gonna make sense, because that's what you're dealing with as a character. And personally, I hate Elliot. I... I've met people like him. To describe the personality type, it's almost the gay stereotype of over-the-top, dramatic, turning everything into a joke in, in a certain way. A lot of the stuff he did, it was like, I would not be surprised if it was like, oh, and also I'm gay. And it was like, yeah, that's right. That was the personality he was kind of being given. And I was just like, ah. Even in your own narration of yourself, I can tell you're annoying. Because there's a moment later in the book, and Lana realized in that moment that she was in love with me, that we were going to be together, that she would leave Jason for me. But then she read my notebook, and you're just like, yep. no, that didn't happen. Yeah. Why have you so fully deluded yourself? Yeah, th and that was, again, something f so weirdly frustrating, and I guess maybe it's just us reacting to the character development of Elliot, which I could, could be seen as a good job by the author. Literal chapters where he would be like, and here's what should have happened. Here's what would happen if this was an Agatha Christie novel. Here's what I wish had happened. And then he literally does an entire chapter of narration and detail. And he's like, but sadly, that's not what happened. Because because life isn't actually a play. And I'm like, what are you doing? Wasting pages. I don't think it helped inform the character in any sort of way. It just, it's like you said, it pulls clue a little bit. Mm hmm False endings. But I don't know. The first book, you get Theo's mind space, but it's not this freaking blatant. It's constant and nonstop. And I'm just like, it feels more like a character study than a novel. Yeah. I think it's just not 
that interesting. Nope. A little whiny. His personal inner monologue is what is narrating the story, almost stream of conscious at points. Yeah. And he's just not a strong enough character to make this type of book work. And so, yeah, a little bit, maybe it's not your style, but maybe it's just not done well. And that's what I'm leaning toward as a connoisseur of mystery over here. Elliot's just not compelling enough to be able to hold the burden that this book has. No. All of Theo's psych stuff wasn't about himself. It was about the patients, which made it very interesting because you had varied forms and new stuff to look at constantly. But also it buries the lead a little bit about when you find out that Theo's the one that murdered her husband. Yep. But this one is just constant. And then you get to the end and he's like, oh, and then I shot her. Oh, I'm terribly surprised. Yep. Oh, goodness. Anyway, so the plot of the book, where do we even start? Someone does get murdered. (laughs) Yeah. Can confirm. Lana is a famous movie star who retired so she could spend time with her son, but the world doesn't know. That's why she retired. Whatever. And she remarries. She had a husband. He died. So she eventually remarries this guy named Jason. So that's Lana, Leo, and Jason. She has an old friend named Kate and then a semi-recently, but kind of a couple years now, friend Elliot. No, they've been friends as long as she's been friends with Kate, I thought. No, because see, she had to move to London to meet Elliot. Oh, that's right. And she was friends with Kate because of a movie she did in London like years ago. That's right. And because Elliot bonded with Lana because they both knew Kate. That's right. Yes. And she has a housekeeper named Agathy. Then there's a guy, a caretaker named Nikos. Nikos is not that important. So we're just going to pick him up and put him to the side a little bit. So all six of them get to the island because... London's weather sucks. That's the initial presentation that we're given. London's weather sucks, so we're going to go to Greece. But the truth of the matter is Jason and Kate are having an affair. Elliot finds out about it. Instead of being a good friend, he schemes and connives ways to get Lana to discover it herself because, oh, you shoot the messenger and whatnot. And then they talk about their relationship and he was about to propose the day she met Jason and blah, 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 blah. And when he thinks of this diverging point where he thinks, oh, we could have gotten married. Oh, she would have been happy with me. It was just... Like you said, the nice guy syndrome. And it's not like, oh, I am pining for her and what we could have had. He legitimately is just like, facts. She would have been happy. Yeah. Nice guy syndrome, like you said. He's delusional. Thinks very highly of himself. And his reality that he has created in his head. But anyway, I just, I hate all of his narrations of Lana because he just gives her value judgments, even though there's no way he can. Also, something I noticed in the beginning of the book, he says he compiled this through his memories, conversations he's had with people after the fact. And he had freely admits he throws in his own thoughts of what happens or people's opinions. That second part stuck out to me near the end of the book. Who is talking to this man afterwards? You know what I'm actually thinking about it now? Everything that came out on trial when he was accused of murder. Is that what he considers conversations I had afterwards? Yeah, she's obviously manipulating it, right? So that you don't pick up that's what's happening. But when you put it together, he would have had to sit through a trial where all these other characters, right? Where Kate explains that Lana came to him and said, this is what I found. This is what my concern is. Here's what we're going to do. Jason telling he didn't know anything that was going on the entire time. All of these people would have ended up being questioned and brought into a trial probably later. So this is all him, like you said, combining what he knew was supposed to happen from his perspective, but then the other points of it later, of the actual facts of it, right, of Jason and Kate arguing and all that kind of stuff, probably came out as facts of his murder trial. Yeah, because you get to the end of the book and none of these people are talking. None of these people are going to talk to Elliot. Oh, they hate him. They all think he's a creep, which is true. They all hate him with a burning passion. Yeah. So that has to have been how he got the information. That's an interesting theory. Yeah. So I normally practice what is known as closed reading, I'm sure, which is a practice in which you only look at what's on the page. Oh, okay. And you don't draw inferences or your own scenes and whatever. But I like that theory so much. I'm do yes, that's just facts now. Nothing else makes sense to me because he does obviously put in where when he thought something should have happened like this, right? Yeah. 
but bringing together the entire narrative he wouldn't have been able to do without those other characters' perspectives, and how else would he have gotten those except for the murder trial? Which is curious, because he gives Kate perspective stuff. He gives Agathy perspective stuff, but he doesn't give perspectives of Jason or Leo or Nikos. Well, he does do a chapter of Nikos. I take that one back. But I just thought it was interesting that he felt comfortable talking for the women characters, but he never does that with the guys. No, he did one for Leo. Remember after he smoked the weed and then went down on the beach and basically had a panic attack and saw the creature? Oh, and he threw up on the beach and stuff yeah so because he does that i thought jason was gonna die yeah i had definitely pinned my money on jason accidentally dying i felt like that would have been more satisfying just in general if you're not gonna give us a satisfying twist you might as well give us a satisfying murder and of all the people jason would be the most satisfying you've already set him up as your villain man but the way he talks about jason is he always admits he's guessing versus the other characters where he tells it to you like it's a story it's just facts yeah but i guess with the exception of nikos he actually has a relationship with every other character because he was involved in their lives with like leo before jason came around i mean assuming that part of the narrative is true that he was hanging out with them and he would go over to lana's house and all that kind of stuff so he has a relationship genuinely with everybody except jason but yeah i thought it was gonna be jason that ended up dying and it doesn't you know like oh cool Jason just gets to continue to run around. He inherits all the money now. Thanks, Elliot. Yeah. I hope Lana had the instinct to change her will before they went to that island, man, because if it was true that she had planned on leaving Elliot a bunch of cash, well, mm, I hope that got rewritten. I don't know if she had the time. It seemed like she wanted to work it out. Granted, we're going off very unreliable narration. Yeah. But in the end, she makes up with Kate. And granted, she feels upset. Let me say it like this. I think she came to the island with hopes of reconciliation. I think by the end of the island visit, she gives up on that. After he obviously doesn't care that she's been murdered, it clicks for her, I think, that he never cared about her. But before that happens, I think she was trying. She was hoping, I'll split Kate and Jason up. They won't be having an affair anymore and we'll work it out, just like she worked it out with Kate. So I don't think she changed her will. No, I'm not talking about her will for Jason. I'm talking about her will for Elliot. Oh, yeah. In the thing, remember she said that she left Elliot $7 million because she would always take care of him, right? Yeah. And so I was wondering if she changed that because if she didn't, well, then yikers. Of course, assuming that's untrue because, again, that came from Elliot. We don't actually know. Granted, with a life sentence, he's not exactly going to be spending it. No, but that's complicated legal work there with a will like that, so. Yeah, and he doesn't have any heirs, so I'm really curious. I think the government just ends up seizing it. Maybe. He has no family. He doesn't have any friends anymore. When he dies, who would he will it to? I don't know. Maybe Marianne. Uh, I can see that. This is, I guess, why you stick to that perspective, because, well, oh boy, the tangents if you don't. The closed reading thing. Yeah. So they've been cheating. And like we said, Elliot's been compulsive about it. He thinks of a way to finally get her to realize the cheating happened, which is putting an earring to Jake's lapel. Yep. Uh, That's kind of weak. Yeah. To me. He put perfume on his shirts. Still weak. Yeah, I mean, he did a lot of different things. And the earring was kind of the last piece of the puzzle. Last straw. If it was me, maybe she already suspected him of cheating, and that's why this confirmed it to her. But all she actually finds, all conclusive evidence, is he had an earring get stuck in his lapel, and Kate has the other one. I mean, I think from Elliot's perspective, she had been thinking something was off, and that was the confirmation. But as evidence goes for affairs, that's pretty decent evidence. I don't know. It depends how they interact. But to me, it just sounds like they were standing next to like. No, Sam, you are too innocent. There's no way. Nuh-uh. When you're having an affair, you take your clothes off. How would the earring get stuck on his lapel? It's not like, oh, lipstick on his collar. It's not all the other classic ones, like the perfume 
also the perfume on the shirt isn't that solid either because yeah he hangs around her anyway because he tries a couple other things he mentions oh Kate and Jason I heard they went to a dinner together and she's like oh Jason hates whatever place I think he was making it up anyway so of course he's bad at it but he does that unfortunately for him the best way would have been to find them in public get her asking questions so that would have been the best one but people apparently keep swarming her because she's really famous I was about to say yeah he did try that which is a little bit of a contradiction with the beginning of the book where he was like oh she can walk around freely in London Londoners don't swarm you like Americans do yeah so that's true I didn't really I didn't realize that discrepancy yeah but anyway the point is he can't find them out in public which I would have played with that one more but I don't know an earring got stuck on his coat Okay. It was enough for her, though, so she gets upset about it. She goes to talk to Elliot. They bond, they talk, they whatever, and they eventually fall asleep. Elliot, during this drunken conversation, has this idea to put on a fake play that Lana died, and that's totally going to break up the affair, because they're going to consider each other murdered. Murderers, yeah. They'll realize how bonkers they both are, or how shallow they both are, how quickly they can turn on each other, and that will break them up. This is a terrible plan. Yeah. And you find out what actually is going on is Elliot's trying to come up with a contrived way to kill Jason. And so that's why it's over the top and ridiculous. But let's just take the plan as Elliot sold it. Lana fakes her death. Jason and Kate turn on each other, thinking the other one's the one that murdered them. And then what? What is the next part of this plan? Kate kills Jason. That's what was supposed to happen. Oh, that's what's supposed to happen. Absolutely. But selling it to Lana because he claims she was totally down for it. And she would have had to be drunk to think it was a good plan. Because you fake your murder, they turn on each other. Then what? You're still alive. No, I think the perspective that he gave Lana was that that would be enough to finally let Jason go. And then they would get to be together again, Elliot and Lana. I say again, they were never actually together. Well, yeah, it's just, I don't know, from Lana's perspective, because she does want to work it out. She makes it very clear. And so Elliot's like, oh, if you do this, they'll no longer want to be together because it'll crumble because they'll think the other one's the murderer. Yeah. And then you have to deal with the fact that you lied about being murdered. He's so wrapped up, like we said, in himself that he can't even see that Lana is totally lying playing him just kind of pacifying him so that they can put on their own thing yeah because he's like even in his version when Lana wakes up and reads the notebook when she wakes up she's like oh that was a silly plan yeah so even he gets that this is stupid bruh anyway and they use that to advantage later on they have Agathy they don't tell her and then Agathy gets upset like what the heck You just faked your freaking murder. Yeah, of course. But realistically, Agathy knew from Lana's perspective what was happening the whole time. Yeah, Lana told her. And so they used his, I don't know, lack of empathy, lack of human understanding, lack of something. But it very clearly played him by having a character act exactly how you would expect them to. Yeah. Except he didn't see it coming. Ah. Like we said, there's just no plot to follow. We literally get the same story from his perspective, but yet a slightly different perspective four different times. It's not that interesting of scenes. And it's so arbitrary when he decides to go back and fix things. Yeah. The first time he does it, it's like, okay, the murder just happened and everyone showed up. Well, I need to go back and fill you in on a couple things. Okay. That's fine. And then the next time, once again, we get to the end and it's like, oh, people inherit money from the will. Anyway, back up again. Yep. Because it's like the first time I was like, oh, let me fill you in on some details you don't realize. Okay, that's fun. Then this time it's, oh, let me fill you in on Lana and my relationship. Yeah. And there was a moment where I thought this was interesting. Just to describe to you how self involved he is so they have a day where they both finally open up and are vulnerable about each other and he kisses Lana and the narrative is very specifically about how he kisses her but has no input back from her we don't even know if she kisses him back yeah 
It's literally just, I kissed Lana. It was soft and slow and da 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 da. And then it moves on. And you're just like, even in your romance, you were only concerned with how you came off. Very interesting. So we go through all that. Then we get, oh my gosh, Lana's not actually dead, which is supposed to be a twist. I ruined the twist because I misinterpreted one of the lines from earlier in the book. And it's like, oh, when I was talking to Lana on a cold and rainy day, I assumed that had been afterwards. And I was like, yeah, Lana's not dead. You already told us. But I went back and looked and he was referring to when they had the heart to heart after his therapy appointment. Yeah. I kind of ruined the twist for myself. I don't know how you felt in that moment. I can't remember where, because I remember texting you at some point in listening to it and said, well, it did get me to gasp, at least at one point. Yeah, because you were like, oh, who murdered him made me gasp. And I was like, oh my gosh, you got to the end. Wow, that's pretty far. And then I finished the book and you were like, oh yeah, I still have like a couple hours left on it. And I was like, what made you gasp? (laughs) Yeah, I'm trying to look back at when I... Oh, it was the fact because they describe her, they describe who's dead, right? And they give you Kate's shawl. Yeah. And so you think it's Kate, which again, I would have found completely plausible as a potential. Oh, yeah. No, I thought it was a red herring immediately. I was like, she stole Kate's scarf or whatever it is and now everyone's gonna think because she did that Kate is it yeah because they give you the whole description of like finding the body everyone freaking out and then they give you the shawl and then it cuts to the next chapters and Elliot pulls back and gives additional details so you don't actually know that it's Lana for a little bit and so when it finally was like and everyone was staring at Lana I was like what it was her that was like the only gasp I was like okay interesting so you didn't place your bet on a red herring and that's basically I don't read mystery. So I know that was not my first inclination to be like, oh, that was totally fake. If we don't have evidence, we just have things. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't surprised that it was Lana dead. I did think it was going to be Kate dead just because that would have been more interesting if it was Kate. Yeah, especially how Elliot was portraying her. Yeah, and it would have been more interesting because more people have motives to kill her. Excuse me, more interesting motives to kill her. Because you have Jason who's trying to cover up the affair and maybe she screwed it up or something. He just got tired of her or whatever. Lana because she was having an affair. Leo because she was having an affair. Agathy because she was having an affair. Yeah. The crimes of passions, like all of them could have been pretty interesting. But no, it's Lana. So Jason wanted money and Kate didn't really have a reason to murder her and neither did Leo or Agathy. Nicholas, because Elliot tries to paint him in a kind of creepy light, honestly. Yeah. He's the obsessive one when probably not. Yeah, a creepy hermit. So it's way less interesting that Lana got murdered than if Kate got murdered. At least in the beginning. Because at the end of the day, when Lana does get murdered, it is a crime of passion. Is a stupid crime of passion. It still is, though. Yeah, so there's the twist that Lana's still alive, which I ruined for myself. And then at this point, Elliot goes back again to the night. Yep, you literally get that same perspective at least two or three times. But... Okay, I would have liked this book from Agathy's perspective. That could have been interesting. And not the, oh, we're all in on this happening. I mean, granted, you could put that to the side and then at the very end, oh, that would have been so good. It was Agathy's perspective throughout this entire thing, her viewings of these people and what they do and what they look like. Yeah. And then she runs off because Lana, whatever. And so they have the conversation and whatnot, which didn't actually happen because Agathy knew going in so she didn't need to be told by Lana what was going on or makeup or anything like that. But you could have done all that and then gotten to the end where Elliot gets murdered and stuff and it would have been such a twist for her suddenly to be like, he did it. And you'd be like, what in the world is going on, Agathy? Oh my goodness. And then it's revealed, oh, that would have been so good. No! Yeah, honestly, same plot, the same everything happens, but just from a different point of view. Because that's kind of one of the nice things about detective novels is you have this situation and then you have the third party that's viewing it kind of as it is instead of with all the BS and the politics. Oh, that would have been so much better. Oh, this book should have been from Agatha's perspective because she calls out Lana. I mean, granted, this scene didn't happen, but Agatha claims that Lana is incapable of love. 
which I think is a fascinating perspective on what would have been actual Lana. But like I said, the scene didn't happen. So maybe she is capable of love. But if we're going to take the scene as fact, maybe Agatha talked about it at the trial, which makes me wonder if Jason didn't talk in the trial or if Elliot just tuned out everything he said. No, I think even based on everything we know about Jason, he was truly kept in the dark. Elliot and Lana didn't decide to tell him the plan from Elliot's perspective. And then Lana and Kate wanted to tell Jason about their plan, but weren't able to get him alone because of his own nonsense. So he truly was the only character in the dark the entire time. So what he knew wouldn't have been relevant. Yeah. I mean, granted, he can definitely speak to Elliot's obsessive behaviors towards his wife. Yeah. But regarding the plans of the whole day, he wouldn't have had a perspective to share. Yeah. Which I still think he could be a valuable witness for that. But that does make me wonder if, granted, we are running with the trial theory. But Agathy thinks Elliot is evil. You're not wrong, girl. Not wrong. Perspective taking. That's the skill that he lacks. For sure. I Even though, ironically, he does a ton of attempted perspective. He tries to, but even he admits that he sucks at it. Yeah. He's just incapable of seeing the situation for what it is and not how he feels it is. And so you don't actually get a very good view of what Elliot's actually like. You have a couple of things that where it bleeds through, like the stalking and his verbiage around Lana always focusing on what he does and not her responses to anything. The fact that he does have these pretend scenes where Lana's totally in love with him for no reason whatsoever, other than to just tell himself that she's totally in love with him. So you have all that, but it's, I don't know, Agathy would have been a way more interesting narrator. It would have been interesting how it would have changed the perspective for sure because you still could have gotten Elliot's selfishness and indifference and a little bit of that crazy stalker vibe but from the third party housekeeper yeah because that could have been one of the twists is why we were going on with all of this finding out that Elliot was doing this crazy stuff because you just have you get on the island you have these six people you kind of get to know the characters as you go Jason's a jerk Leo's we don't actually get a good perspective of what actual Leo is like because Elliot views him as an extension of his mother for so long until he starts doing things that in his mind Lana wouldn't do. But also a little bit, I feel like when Leo was making fun of him and laughing at him and whatever, I still feel like he viewed those actions as if Lana was doing them and not that Leo was doing them. He holds it against Lana and not Leo. Oh, that would have been a more interesting death. If he had killed Leo. Anyway, so he has his issues and we don't get to see him. But if we had Agathy, we'd learn about everybody on the island. And then we start noticing their dynamics and things. You can see how Elliot stuff. You Maybe Agathy sees Elliot stalking Lana or following her or following Kate. Something going on. It could have been so much better. Agathy's perspective would have been so much better. Because this would have been the first novel he writes in I, which is a totally valid first person is always totally valid but I don't know I wonder if Alex is getting bogged down by the eyes that he feels he needs to so completely show this character yeah when not being so upfront would have fared better oh no you're telling me the guy that's obsessed with Lana kills Lana in the end <laughs> literally every story of a female being nice to a man ever this is just a nice guy story she was nice to him at a party and then they hung out for a little bit because she was lonely yep and now he's an obsessive stalker that thinks either you marry him or he's going to murder you the most basic nice guy story go on reddit look for a tag talking about girls what happened when you interacted with a nice guy and that's like the most basic story you can get yeah so that's one reason it's unsatisfying is oh yeah that happened in everyday life but it's not a commentary on nice guys it's not a commentary on violence against women it's not even a commentary on obsession he's just like people were laughing at me i took a shotgun i shot lana three times anyway i'm in prison yeah i think they tried to do something with the whole trauma piece of explaining his inner child came out and you know almost felt like possessed by the wind and all 
that kind of stuff. But which I just stand here and I'm like, did you do a lot of therapy, Alex? And that's why you're obsessed with this topic? Maybe. Did your therapist tell you this? And you're like, I must share this with the world because I do that sometimes. I'll catch myself being like, I need to tell everybody about this. But you didn't need to write three books about it. Yeah. When you only had one book in you. Yeah, you only needed to do the first one. This is the first one where he's not a therapist, but it feels very therapist-y. Oh, no, yeah. It definitely gives off the inner child work I do love and the whole like, bringing out young Elliot or whatever Elliot's original name was, giving him what he needs, you know, taking care of him. That is legitimate inner child work. So you do get a little bit out of that. I will give this book credit for one thing and one thing only. They talk about the inner child a lot, which I've heard Yeah, plenty of times. Your inner child's sad, your inner child's whatever. You need to connect with your inner child and whatever. And I guess I've just never thought about what that connection would be. And so it's like this abstract, I need to connect with my inner child. But this book goes on and talks about, you have been created because that little child needed an adult to be like you. Yep. And so that's why you end up as you are. And so to connect with that child, you basically need to be the parent or whatever authority figure that the child needed the time. Yep. Needed from other people. And that made a lot of sense to me. I think that helped me on my personal journey. And so if someone reads this book, and granted, some of you might read this book and then just never heard about the inner child ever. And so this would be a great entry point. But even for those that have heard it, but maybe not interacted with it much, I still think it could help. And so at the end of the day, if someone reads The Fury and it helps them, then this book has been worth it. Yeah. But considering it's not a self-help book and it's a mystery book, it's disappointing. Yeah. Right a book about the inner child not whatever this is so lana wakes up she follows agathy eventually she asks nikos for a favor and they basically turn it around on elliot and catch him in a bunch of lies he's been telling he's not good at lying by the way no like he's like oh kate nikos is dead jason pushed him off a cliff that's easily verifiable and it catches up to him because he thought oh Nikos isn't gonna leave his cabin for the rest of the night he's just trying to force her to murder Jason because that's his whole plan Jason gets murdered Lana's gonna fall in love with me yeah and so he lies about that he lies about a couple other things tells her the truth about the will that he needs money that his business is going down that's truth but there's a bunch of other lies that he tells in that moment He kind of starts scrambling there. So badly scrambling. I can't get over the Nikos thing. And that's what really, I mean, granted, they all know he was lying to begin with because Jason didn't murder anyone. But I think that was your first clue that he sucks. And he's like, oh, I'm so good at writing, but my improv is terrible. Your writing is terrible. (laughs) Yeah. As we come to find out. But scrambling. And then he was confused that it didn't work. It seems like the lies have come back to hit him. Jason and Kate are like, oh, let's kill him. And then Leo shows up and he's like, yeah, I mean, Nikos is already there. He's the one that forced him to go over and talk to them and not just stare at them like a creep he is. Yeah. So everyone is there but Lana. And so basically, we're going to shoot you. We're going to force you to shoot yourself in the head. Yeah. Here's my thing. He doesn't end up dying because Kate explains that the gun shoots blanks it's a prop gun it is not true because blanks are cartridges <laughs> they just don't have gunpowder but they contain other stuff they can have like paper or plastic i want to say it's called a, like a wad but it's something that keeps it from exploding but there's something in it and it is still deadly at short distances yeah the gun was placed against his temple. Yeah. It's not a blank like, oh, you don't shoot anything. A blank is still a cartridge. There is something in the gun that is being fired out. You can murder someone with a blank. But then it didn't ever make sense that Elliot would die because how do you then explain the narration? So I knew Elliot couldn't have died somehow, so. Yeah, and so I'm like, oh, I'm curious. How does it happen? But then she's like, oh, it's a blank. It was literally against his temple. Yeah. Imagine shooting a Nerf gun at your temple, but more dangerous. Way more force, yeah. And it's not foam being shot at you. Anyway, gun knowledge aside... I don't actually have gun knowledge. I just have forensic knowledge. There you go. Which I guess is gun knowledge in and of itself. But they absolutely could have killed Elliot. And I was wondering, it's a book. So I was like, is this a ghost talking? Is this Elliot's consciousness 
after being murdered. Yeah. Because there's totally books like that where it's like, oh, here's the twist. I've been dead this whole time. That's fair, I guess. And so I was more interested, okay, how are you pulling this off? And then it's like, oh, he's still alive. And I was like, oh. Well, never mind. That was disappointing. And then they make fun of him and it's like, my childhood bullies made fun of me. Yep. And he gets possessed by the wind and shoots Lana. The wasps were a weird touch. The wasps were a very weird touch. That definitely had to have just been like a herring because I honestly forgot that they were introduced in the very beginning until I was looking back through your notes. Well, I thought, because the wasps are introduced very early in the book. Yeah. The groundskeeper sees the wasps. He's like, oh, I don't want to destroy that beautiful nest. Let me try to make their flying power closer to mine instead of going towards the big house. I was still in the, and then there was none, which everyone gets murdered according to a rhyme. And one of them is about someone getting getting stung by a bee and then they die oh and so i thought someone was going to get stung by a wasp and they die or supposedly get stung by a wasp yeah no they're just there because later on they need to hang out with elliot very weird yeah to go back to the wind i go back and forth his usage of the wind is a little bit higher than you tried because i do think he succeeds sometimes and maybe if this was a better book i'd be all for it but it's not quite you got there yeah it's used very well it's the reason they're cut off from society which once again and then there was none Hmm. they're cut off from society they talk about how it's kind of shaped the greek people they talk about aura which is the goddess of read the book it explains it very well yeah and then it talks about like it's called the fury because it drives people mad essentially and at the end he gets attacked by a whirlwind And then he goes crazy, and then he goes and murders Lana. Yep. Eh. I wish the wind had been used more often, but I don't know how with the current plot it could have been without it being contrived. Going back to my fake book idea, Agathy's perspective could have used the wind so much better. Yeah, because she has that cultural connection to it. Yeah. She's from Greece. She's literally waitressed at the diner. Yeah. Sorry, not the diner. It's a very fancy restaurant. The fancy restaurant that they eat dinner at. Yeah. She's from the area. She's a hop skipping away from this particular island she absolutely could drive in the folklore and the mythology of the wind oh and by the way the island's haunted oh yeah that mentioned and then never brought up again ever something about something in roman times nothing that could have been used to better effect the wind could have been used for the better effect the goddess could have been used to a better effect But I don't know how he could have with this story. This is a story you wanted to tell. And I don't think you could have done it. So yeah, this is going to be a short episode. And I told you that because that's it. Yeah, that's basically it. It's told in a different way, a couple different times. And you get different perspectives, but... But it's the same plot over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Also, it never confirms, but I definitely believe he killed Barbara West. Yeah, I thought that was going to be part of the epilogue because he mentions the day that they were at the top of the stairs and he could have pushed her over, blah, blah, blah. And then he, at the epilogue, he's like, yeah, so the day she fell down the stairs and died and I went to see her body and everything. And I'm like, mm. I think you also killed... And granted, she was a horrible person, but I also think you killed her too. Yeah. you just a murderer. Yeah. And now we're building this world. My only issue at the end is Elliot is such a unreliable narrator. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the point. I don't know. And that's what I would love to... I just like talk to the author. It's just like, was that your point? I don't understand because it seems like it wasn't done intentionally, but it was just so bad that... Was it intentional? I don't know. I feel uncomfortable calling him out a straight liar, but... I don't know. Part of me wonders if he wanted to cast a villain. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway. Oh, yeah. His split with Lana is obviously because Barbara West told Lana that he's a crazy person and he has a fake identity and all this other stuff. And oh, by the way, he's totally going to murder me, which Lana throws back in his face later. He's like, oh, you want to kill me like Barbara West? And yeah, he ends up killing you like Barbara West. Yep. A little bit. So, yeah. That's the book. Kind of disappointing. There's an art to an unreliable narrator. And you have to be very good at it because the audience is automatically going to be frustrated. Yeah, it is hard to toe that line. I can't honestly say I've read a book with a good, unreliable narrator. It's because you're already starting downfield. 
you're already in trouble. As soon as you pick an unreliable narrator, your audience is going to be frustrated with them. Well, no, I guess the first book, The Silent Patient, was an unreliable narrator. But again, it was done in a perspective where you didn't realize they were unreliable until the plot twist. He was unreliable to the end, and that's what changes everything. You're like, holy crap. Yes. My narrator's unreliable. He's been lying this whole time. Yes. And that's why that one's so fascinating. But Elliot tells you in the first chapter that he's unreliable. From the beginning. And then he keeps calling himself out on it over and over. I literally think it's chapter four of part one. I thought I was going to just give up and say I can't read this book at that chapter because it was like three times he's trying to tell a story and he pulls back out. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Or, oh, I'm sorry. That was my own bias creeping in. And I'm like, oh my, I wanted to bang my head against the wall. I was, are you kidding me? I cannot listen to this man anymore. Yeah. And it did slow down. His interruption slowed down and got more like, okay, so I'll give you the narration and then I'll pull you back. But those first couple chapters, oh, not good. No. So you know he's unreliable to begin with. And then as the book goes on, you realize even when he thinks he's being reliable, he's unreliable. Yep. So all of this is trash. And so when I was going back through, I'm like, oh, let me talk about scenes. But they didn't happen. Literally, yeah. Entire scenes that are fake and made up. So what's there to even talk about? Yep. General thoughts. Crazy. Wild book. I don't even know. I don't even know. What is there to talk about? There's nothing. Silent patient. You get to the end and you can talk about the entire book again. And even the last book, while we didn't like the ending, there was still a twist. Yeah. That made you rethink some of the stuff in the books. Because Mariana is also an unreliable. All of his characters are unreliable narrators. He did it well in the first book. But in the second book, you're like, wow, Mariana, you have problems problems. Yeah, I don't know. For sure. And then you get to the end, you're like, wow, you really are. It was confirmed you're an unreliable narrator. But this one, he gives the game away from the beginning of the book. I don't feel like there are any true twists. Maybe Lana is still alive halfway through the book. But like I said, I ruined it for myself, so I don't know if the natural person would consider that a twist or not. But Elliot shooting Lana is not a twist. No, at the end. Oh, I have caught you. I did the thing. You've already done this. Yep. Do you have no more ideas? Go read another Agatha Christie book. Yeah, I guess this is why we don't peg someone as a modern day Agatha Christie after one book, because Agatha Christie built up a lifetime of reputation for novels to get to where they were. And you can't claim that about somebody after one book. You have three books and two out of the three is the narrator did it. Yep. Yeah, Hocus Pocus ain't working. Try something different, man, next time. If you're going to do it again, it'll be a while before something comes out probably. But if you're going to do it again, please switch it up. Yeah. The first book I loved. And so I pre-ordered the second one. And then the second one wasn't good. And then I was like, cool, never pre-ordering one of your books. <laughs> and now that we have had this third one, maybe I'll change my mind by the time he finally comes out with something else. But I feel absolved yeah. of having to try to keep up with them. I don't think anything revolutionary is coming out of this pipeline ever again. No. And I think at the end of the day, he wrote the idea, the setting. It does draw on a lot of tropes that we love. Like I said, I immediately was like six people on an island, someone died. This is Clue. Let's go for it. Even if it was just a different version of Clue with a twist, I would have been fine. Right. So like, it's not that the story itself, I think, was a problem. Like you said literally even just writing it from someone else's perspective would have changed how we would have received it yeah because we have immediately what comes to my mind of they did it better glass onion glass onion i don't know if you've seen it you should it's very good I don't know if you've seen Knives Out. It's okay. I've wanted to watch both. My husband and I, for Knives Out, we both thought of a better ending and then the ending happened and we were like, meh. But Glass Onion, I think, does it really well. But I might be wrong on the number of people, but six people on the island, you think things are happening one way. Halfway through the movie, it shows a different perspective and you're like, holy crap, everything's a lie, but also everything isn't a lie. Who did it? What's happening? What's going on? Who has been murdered? No, she has hasn't but yes she has oh this other person's possibly murdered you can do it so well and he even has a detective character you know who we always like but even if you didn't have that detective character i think you could have told a compelling story with the cast of characters that you have there and i think they do and then the final whodunit is very interesting and so 
that's the first one that comes to mind. And that's very recently, instead of comparing him to just Agatha Christie. Yeah. It's been 100 years. That's a modern day kind of this story. You get a bunch of people on an island. Things start going down. Fake murders, but real murders and all this other stuff. And so it was, I don't know. Yeah, nope, that's a good point. Could have been done better. Although I am just a little bit happy he gets out of England because that last book being a love letter to Oxford was torture yeah i would have been okay with a love letter to greece yeah that would have been great but i'm also okay with this idea of oh greece is beautiful but it has a deadly side but like we said that's not used to its fullest advantage one question for the author why why the narrator murderer trope again why did he feel it was necessary why did he feel like it would actually throw off his audience yeah i don't know i would be shocked how many people just picked up the fury that hadn't read silent patient that's fair i'd be very curious for that percentage because i feel like that's where he made his name yeah that's where people know him it's like we said that first book has over two million reviews on goodreads yeah in comparison his second book has three hundred thousand. Even the things that I saw walking into Books A Million or Barnes and Noble, I think it was Barnes and Noble that had it set up. It was very clearly Alex, the author of The Silent Patient. Yeah, they're marketing to what people know about him. Because it's a strong book. So if you go in assuming people have read the first book, you got to have more than one trick. Yeah, and you don't. I would be very curious why he felt so strongly that he needed to have another murderer narrator. Yeah, I don't remember if I asked this in the last one, but what is your relationship like with your therapist? Do you have one? Because where are you getting this perspective slash idea about therapy? Obviously, you know about therapeutic concepts. Like you said, inner child work, the basics of what you're going to get online when you look it up is you have this child and the child needs healing and blah, blah, blah. But it's not until you're actually working with a therapist do you get told that the way you do that then is identifying what does the child need in a moment and then how can you reparent, right? That's what that is. And so obviously you have some understanding of my profession, sir, but you good? You seeing a therapist? Because you should be. Yeah. Like I said, this comes off more of a character study. Yeah. It felt like I want to play around with a person that has some sort of something that he picked out and then he just played with it for an entire book be like oh what would be their reasoning what would be their thought process if they did this how would they justify it in their minds and stuff versus a mystery book rating bumpy boat ride out of 10 it's boring and yet we're stuck here and it's miserable yeah a little bit of waiting for the storm to calm down waiting to get there honestly i was not expecting it to get good in the book and so it was just like i felt like i was just getting to the end to be like okay but what will the ending be exactly versus feeling compelled and enjoying myself yeah same here waiting out a storm not knowing when it's gonna end and there's nothing on tv Yes, you're in a bunker and your cell phone died. And so you've got to listen to someone tell a story. Because that is something that happened to me a lot as a kid growing up in Tornado Alley. You'd go down into a bunker on a tornado warning and you got to listen to the old man sit there and tell his life story. So yes, that is what this book was to me. Read again. No. I own it, but nope, won't do it. Probably not. I'm donating it. I can't donate an audiobook, so. I ended up having to buy it because of library issues and. Regret. The author himself has enough goodwill for me that I'm not mad about supporting him. No. But I'm definitely not keeping it. Yeah. Oh, unfortunately, you can't donate an audiobook library, so it'll just sit in my library in the cloud. It is what it was. Yeah. But have you read this book? Who do you think is the modern Agatha Christie? Do you have any book recommendations for us? Tell us all about it in the comments below. If you like the video, hit like. And if you're enjoying yourself, hit subscribe for more. Thank you for exploring the fury with us. Join us next time when we'll be covering The Daughter of Dr. Monroe by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. I'm Sam Reiner. And I'm Caitlin. And we hope to see you and a friend here next time. Escape with Me Book Club is a Lunar Skulk production. Check us out on TikTok or Instagram to keep up to date with us. Lunar underscore S-K-U-L-K.